Stock Basics and Introduction to Stock Valuation with Diana Temsky from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Common stock, I include some notes here for you just as an introductory um, note taking session, if you will, some lecture notes for you. This is not all inclusive, it's not a license or permission to skip your textbook reading in chapter 8. Do that, don't miss it, it's important. But this is just to walk you through some of the basics and certainly provide examples of stock valuation problems for you as well. Common stock. If you own common stock, if that's your investment vehicle of choice, which for many people it is in one way, shape, or form, or another, you were an owner of that firm. So if you bought Facebook stock during their initial public offering recently, you'd be an owner of Facebook. If you bought Green Bay Packers stock, you're an owner of the Green Bay Packers. Um, they don't exactly fit the mold because their stock's not exactly traded, but you know, hey, you'd be an owner. For most publicly traded firms, that means those firms that have their stock trading on the New York Stock Exchange and, and other exchanges, for most of those firms, the common stock is very widely dispersed, owned by thousands of people, if not millions. Um, so does that mean that ownership is a good indication of control of the, over the firm? No. For most publicly traded firms, it's not the motivation of the owner of the stock to have any kind of say in the firm, the motivation is probably to earn a return on an investment for many people. So take that however you want, um, but read your textbook author and what he has to say to explain further to you that those implied rights of ownership don't usually amount to a whole lot of control for the average investor because ownership is so widely dispersed among so many people. Um, a reminder for you. The whole point of financial management um, is to maximize the stock price and to create value for the shareholders. That should be the underlying theme of everything that a financial manager does. Um, it should be long term in focus and sustainable in focus as well. So why does somebody buy common stock as an investor? What's the motivation? Well, most people buy it for a return, quite frankly. The returns that an investor sees with common stock um, takes in two forms. The first is dividends, and the second is capital gains. There are no guarantees for either. Um, there's no guarantee for dividend payments. Firms are usually pretty upfront in their dividend policy, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna stay that way, however, however they've outlined it. And there's no guarantee for some promised future stock price when you want to sell it. So common stock represents the greatest risk to the investor, but yet the greatest possible return. Always a correlation between risk and return with investments. So before we get started in finding the intrinsic value of a stock and discussing that, I want to take a second to pose the question, what if there are no dividends for a stock? And a question I usually pose in a face-to-face -face class um, is this, do stocks that do not pay dividends still have value? And it usually stimulates a nice discussion. Usually people come up with examples, um, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is, of course they do. Um, why? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is that there's usually an expectation with a stock that's not paying dividends that at some point in the future, the stock will pay dividends not always the case, but oftentimes turns out to be true. Um, for example, Apple. No dividends were paid um, by the Apple company. Steve Jobs wasn't going to pay dividends ever. That was his intention. He wanted to plow all of the earnings back into research and development. He passed away. The direction of the company changed. And lo and behold, they're now paying dividends. So there's that expectation that that may occur. There's still plenty of stocks out there that don't pay dividends. Um, the assumption is, and kind of the rule of thumb, for companies not paying dividends, um, they're usually growing at a rapid rate. They're usually growth companies. Um, think Chipotle, um, Amazon, Google, those types of companies that are just continuously growing and their earnings are being put back into the company to continue to advance and develop new ideas. Investors are okay with that typically because they still have the expectation of capital gains, buy low, sell high. 
that's still there for an investor to realize. So, of course, they still have, still have value. It's important to remember um, the quote on the bottom of the slide by Warren Buffett that I always appreciate. When you buy a stock, price is what you pay. Value is what you get. And that value with stock is oftentimes very subjective. And in a lot of cases, it's really in the eye of the beholder. So back on track to this introduction of, of stock valuation, the intrinsic value of a stock, what in the world does that mean? The intrinsic value is the actual value of a stock based on perceptions of a stock's true value. So based on the perceptions in the marketplace of a stock's true value, this is based on a number of assumptions that we'll explore in a few minutes. Um, those assumptions have to do with future cash flows the intrinsic value of a stock may or may not be the same as a current market price. We express the intrinsic value as P sub zero. And it's important to note that um, the intrinsic value as found and studied by market analysts in the securities market, in the real world, if you will, uh, they do something called fundamental analysis um, to find the true value of a stock. You can read it about that in your textbook. I urge you to. It is in your chapter. There's probably only a paragraph or two, and it's certainly worth reading. Um, but that that is very important to the intrinsic value of a stock. Fundamental analysis that's done um, in the invent investment community. Excuse me. Um, a couple of notes here for you on value investors and how investing is done. Value investors try to find stocks with market prices below their intrinsic value. So if a stock is selling below what its true value is, it's seen as a bargain. Um, and we would say it's underpriced and value investors would like that. They'd be happy, they'd be thrilled because they can make money. Stocks selling above their intrinsic value, however, are said to be overpriced. So if they're selling for more than they're truly worth, then that's a problem as perceived um, by value investors. Now, does that mean everybody's right and everyone's spot on with investing? No, there is a lot of risk involved, a lot of assumptions built into everything, um, and a lot of unknowns based on the market. So just a side note, everything is very subjective, but we try and use the best models we can in valuing, valuing stock, excuse me, um, and help make sense of it. So let's take out how we're going to value a stock. The value of any financial asset, if you remember, um, the same definition was posed to you with bonds, but the value of any financial asset is equal to the present value of its expected future cash flows. For stocks, this can be quite difficult and very subjective. Cash flows vary. There's no guarantee of a cash flow with a stock. There's the hope of, of capital gains, buying low and selling high. There's the hope of dividends maybe, but things change in the economy and the you know macroeconomic environment that are outside of firms' control. So it can be difficult and very subjective to value stock. We're going to use one model in this class. There are several. Um, we're just going to use the constant growth model, also known as the Gordon growth model, um, named after the famous um, finance expert that developed it. This model does use expected dividends to calculate the value of a stock. So does it work for every stock? Absolutely not. But this is the one we're going to use in this class. Um, so we're going to apply it to those stocks that pay dividends. So here's the model we're going to use to value stock, the Gordon growth model. It's right there in front of you. P hat sub zero is equal to Z, D sub zero times one plus G divided by R sub S minus G. And we can also express it as D sub one divided by R sub S minus G. Now notice the two different variations you have. Both of them have the same denominator, it's only the numerator that changes. So basically what that tells you is that D sub 1 equals D sub 0 times 1 plus G. Now what do each of these stand for? Well P hat sub 0 
is our intrinsic value. That's what we're trying to solve for. We can interchange that with P sub 0, P sub 0, meaning the current stock price. D sub 0 is the last dividend the firm paid, the most current or most recent dividend. G is our growth rate. R sub S is our required rate of return. D sub 1 is the next dividend to be paid by the firm, or the expected dividend. To use this model, there's an assumption that dividends will grow at a constant rate forever. We all also assume in this model that dividends, the growth in dividends, the dividends that are growing from year to year, are doing so for a given firm as a result of growth in earnings, that a firm is not continuing to increase the dividends even if they're not doing well. So we kind of assume that too. There's a necessary condition to using this model, and that is that the required rate of return, the R sub S, has to be greater than the growth rate. Otherwise, it becomes meaningless. It's not going to really mean anything for us if our denominator is negative. Um, a couple of notes here for you on this slide for the Gordon model. Uh, much of this I already stated in the previous, um, with the previous slide. So here it is if you missed it. Um, jot it down in your notes. You got it here now. The Gordon growth model in the real world for, for stock valuation, it is appropriate and works and is fantastic. It is most appropriate for mature companies, those companies that have been around a while, that aren't going anywhere, that are essentially mature, um, think Dow Jones Industrial type companies, companies on the Dow. It works for firms with a stable history of growth um, because it's expected that they would have a stable future of growth. It is imperfect. Um, once again, the math behind the model is useful. We use it in all kinds of things in finance, um, and we're going to go ahead and use it in this class. This will be the model we do use. We'll do non-constant growth. You have another screencast on that. Um, know that there are other ways to value stock valuation. That's all fine and dandy. This is the model we're going to use. This is one finance class that you're going to have for many of you. If you're a finance major, fantastic. You can explore all kinds of other stock valuation models. If you're not, you're saying to yourself, thank goodness, this is all I need. So let's put this model to use. So here's a sample problem, and this sample problem does stem from a problem in a previous textbook um, we used for this class a few years ago. And, and with my own little tweak on it to have um, a Seinfeld reference in the company name. Jimmy Shoes Incorporated most recent annual dividend was $3.55 a share. This firm has been growing at a consistent 4% rate for several years, but analysts generally believe that better times are ahead and that future growth will be in the neighborhood of 5%. Jimmy's stock is currently selling for $75, and stocks similar to Jimmy's earn returns ranging from 8% to 10%. So the first part of the problem, I'm going to ask you to calculate the values for a share of Jimmy's stock at the interest rates or the returns of 8, 9, and 10%. So here it's basically just plunking it into the model. So here on the screen, I've plunked it all into the model for you. Um, I highly recommend you just pause this, um, take the model that you jotted down a few minutes ago when, when I introduced it to you, or the equation that is, um, plunk all these numbers in, calculate it, make sure you come out with the same answers as I do. So what did I do here? Um, notice I didn't do anything with the market price. We're finding the intrinsic value, and notice that in putting my solutions here, I forgot the hat over the P for the intrinsic value. I do that frequently and I apologize. I so frequently forget to put that hat on there. So anyways, the intrinsic values of Jimmy's stock given the three different returns are as laid out for you on the screen. So the first one, we have the $3.55 last dividend paid and that's gonna follow for all of them, times one plus the 5% growth rate and then the denominators for each are the only things that change. Our R sub S changes from 8% to 9% to 10% in each calculation. 
So notice that the intrinsic value for this stack 